A Lined by Writing By Charles Dickens Audiobook 33x73 This was his child's history of England, successive chapters of which appeared which appeared at irregular intervals in the magazine between January 25, 1851 and December 10, 1853. At this point his nine children ranged in age from five-month-old Dora to fourteen-year-old Charlie and when the child's history was published in three volumes, 1852-54, Dickens dedicated it to my own dear children, whom I hope it may help, by and by, to read with interest larger and better books on the same subject. He used as a crib a history of England compiled 1837-39 by a hack writer called Thomas Cately and was reviving an intention first expressed, and perhaps briefly acted on, in May 1843 when he told Douglas Gerald that he was writing a little history of England for five-year-old Charlie intended to counteract any conservative or high church notions to which the child might be exposed when a little older. The best way of guarding against any such horrible result, is, I take it, to wring the parrot's necks in his very cradle. By parrots Dickens meant all those who extolled the good old days, those Tory times before the Reform Bill of 1832 which stretched back into those ages of darkness, wickedness and violence denounced by the goblin of the great bell in the chimes. In his preliminary word in the first number of Household Words Dickens had expressed the hope that everything in the magazine would have the effect of making its readers thankful for the privilege of living in this summer dawn of time, this great new age of human progress and enlightenment that he, like so many of his contemporaries, believed was opening up. His child's history would play its part in this by showing, with plenty of gory detail, how the English people had been for so long afflicted, down to the glorious revolution of 1688, by a succession of weak or vicious rulers and meddling, over mighty priests, beginning with the Druids, with Henry VIII, a blot of blood and grease upon the history of England, featured as villain-in-chief. Only two rulers meet with Dickens's unqualified approval, namely Alfred the Great, very sound on the administration of justice and on national education, and Carlyle's great hero Cromwell, whose brisk way with Parliament's Dickens wishes would serve as a warning to all such assemblies to avoid long speeches, and do more work. During the first two months of 1851 Dickens and Bulwer-Lytton worked on the prospectus for their proposed new institution, which Bulwer-Lytton wanted to call, rather grandly, Our Order. The name eventually chosen was the Guild of Literature and Art, inspired by the name given by Old Saxon custom to societies in which the members of a class contributed to the benefit Charles Dickens of each other. Dickens declared himself delighted with Bulwer-Lytton's as yet unnamed comedy, which he himself eventually titled Not So Bad As We Seem, or, Many Sides to a Character. He lamented that he could not play the character part of the heroine's father because, as he wrote to Bulwer-Lytton on January 5th, Assumption has charms for me. I hardly know for how many wild reasons so delightful, that I feel a loss of oh I can't say what exquisite foolery, when I lose a chance of being someone, in voice and see not at all like myself. He felt, however, that he had to play the hero because he alone could hold the play together in this role. The character, Lord Wilmot, a young man at the head of the mode more than a century ago, in fact offered Dickens plenty of histrionic scope, to say nothing of rich costumes, elaborate wigs and other accoutrements dear to the heart of amateur actors. Wilmot is a witty fop with a heart of gold who role plays within the play, pretending to be the scandal-mongering bookseller Edmund Curl in a scene with the impoverished author David Fallon. Fallon's hapless dependence on haughty aristocrats or unscrupulous publishers is depicted as representative of the writer's plight in the previous century and the scene ends with Wilmot promising to become Fallon's patron, which sits rather oddly with the Guild's anti-patronage stance. Point seven Dickens seized the chance to begin advertising the Guild on March 1 at a public banquet honoring McCready's retirement from the stage. Bulwer-Lytton was in the chair and Dickens, dressed for the occasion with spectacular elegance,
proposed his health. After praising McCready for being ever anxious to assert the order of which he is so great an ornament, Dickens humorously alluded to what he called the popular prejudice that authors were not a particularly united body but claimed that among the followers of literature there could hardly have been one further above those little grudging jealousies, which do sometimes disparage its brightness than bulwer lytton He then spoke briefly about their collegial scheme to smooth the ragged way of young laborers, both in literature and the fine arts, and to soften, but by no eleemosynary means, the declining years of meritorious age. Point eight three days later Dickens approached the Duke of Devonshire to ask if the premiere of the new comedy might take place in the grand setting of Devonshire House, Piccadilly, before, if they would come, Victoria and Albert. As has been pointed out, however, this invocation of aristocratic, and even royal, Patronage at the outset underlines a certain confusion at the heart of the guild scheme which we have already noted as present in bulwer lyttons play. The Duke of Devonshire was well known for his graciousness and for being a generous patron of writers. He had, for example, come very handsomely to the rescue of the ever impecunious Lee Hunt. Dickens possibly met him in 1845 when he had had to dash up to Chatsworth the Duke's country seat, to see Paxton in connection with daily news arrangements. The Duke now responded very positively to Dickens's letter, revealing himself to be a great fan the year of the Guild. 1850-1851 of its writer, I never missed reading a number of his beginning with Pickwick, and told him I could pass examination on all his histories, and placing his London mansion at Dickens's command. In due course he also obtained the promise of royal attendance. Immediately following this Dickens plunged with utmost rapture and vehemence into detailed preparations for the production of the comedy, which it was intended afterwards to perform publicly at the Hanover Square Rooms. Point nine, the Guild project and the production of bulwer lyttons comedy were major preoccupations for Dickens for the first four months of 1851. During that time he nevertheless managed to write, besides the first three chapters of his child's history, no fewer than six articles for household words as well as collaborating in six more. Some of these articles are campaigning ones like Birth, M.R.S. Meek, Of a Son, February 22nd, and A Monument of French Folly, March 8th respectively protesting against the antiquated practice of swaddling newborn babies and the continuance of Smithfield Market in the heart of London. Others were process or exploratory ones like Plate Glass, February 1st, and Spitalfields, April 5th. In the case of the three last-named articles research trips had been required prior to the writing. Finest of all is Bill Sticking, March 22nd to which Dickens subsequently chose to give pride of place in reprinted pieces, the collection of his own household words articles made for the 1858 library edition of his works. This article, which occupies just over a quarter of the issue in which it appears, concerns the large advertising vans, plastered all over with sometimes garish advertisements and driven at a walking pace, that were a notable, and frequently inconvenient, feature of London's streets at the time. Dickens imagines himself riding inside one of them with a quintessentially Dickensian character, full of comic professional pride, whom he calls the king of the bill stickers and from whom he learns much about the tricks of the trade. Point ten from the beginning of 1851 he was beset by even more domestic concerns than usual. He had to embark on a search for a new house as his lease of Devonshire Terrace was coming to an end and apparently could not be renewed. He also had trouble with Fred who was now in financial difficulties and trading on Dickens's name to obtain credit. He is rasping my very heart just now, Dickens told Burdett Coutts on January 18. Then, in early March Catherine became seriously ill with some kind of nervous trouble that caused violent headaches as well as giddiness and dimness of sight. Dickens believed she had been for some years intermittently suffering, albeit in a milder form, from this disorder, which he called an alarming disposition of blood to the head. 
the so-called cold water cure at Malvern in Worcestershire for nervous and other diseases was at the height of its vogue at this time and Dickens arranged for Catherine to go there at once, attended by Anne Brown. He placed her under the care of Dr. James Wilson, founder of the Malvern Charles Dickens Hydropathic Establishment, who had earlier treated Bulwer Lytton. Dickens himself immediately followed her down to Malvern as did Georgina a bit later, though she seems to have returned to London subsequently, and he planned for some of the children to move there as well. Point eleven Dickens took lodgings for himself, Catherine and Anne Brown in Knutsford Lodge, Malvern, and began a commuting existence. He travelled up to London at least once or twice a week in order to continue house hunting, attend to household words and Urania Cottage business, and, on top of all this, to begin twice weekly, five-hour rehearsals of Bulwer Lytton's comedy, this trifling addition to my usual occupations he calls it in a letter to Burdett Coutts of March 20. In Malvern he continued the child's history, he has great fun in Chapter 3, published on March 29, excoriating St. Dunstan as an overweening priest and Queen Elfrida as a melodramatic villainess, and worked on a new farce, to be played as an afterpiece to not so bad as we seem. But he did not feel, he told Bulwer Lytton on March 23, that farce writing quite suited him, nor was it what his public now expected from him. I have an uneasy sense of the impossibility of expressing anything, through such a medium, that people would expect from me. He wrote also to Forster, I am constantly striving, for my reputation's sake, to get into it a meaning that is impossible in a farce, my italics. This seems to connect with the apologetic tone of his preface to the cheap edition of Sketches. Boz with his farcical tales and dramatic pieces about the follies and misadventures of a bunch of comic stereotypes belonged to earlier days. From Charles Dickens in 1851 the reading public expected much more in the way of meaning. Point twelve. Suddenly, alarming news about his father cut across everything else. John and Elizabeth Dickens were lodging with Robert Davy, an eminent surgeon, in Keppel Street, Bloomsbury. Dickens had asked David to accommodate his parents so that a close eye could be kept on John's state of health, which had evidently been causing some concern. On the morning of March 25 John suddenly became very ill and had to undergo, without anaesthetic, an extremely painful bladder operation. He had been suffering pain a long time but had concealed the extent of the problem. Dickens, who was in London, visited his father immediately after the operation, when his room was a slaughterhouse of blood, and found him he reported to Catherine, wonderfully cheerful and strong-hearted. But his condition slowly deteriorated and on Saturday March 31st he died, oh so quietly, at about five in the morning. Dickens had as it happened, come up from Malvern the previous day and had been at the dying man's bedside for many hours. During this vigil he was doubtless remembering, amidst much else, the father of those earlier days about whom he had written to Forster. By me, as a sick child, he has watched night and day, unweariedly and patiently, many nights and days. His own old trouble came back to him as it always did in times of great emotional stress. The Year of the Guild 1850-1851 All this goes to my side directly, he told Catherine on March 25th, and I feel as if I had been struck there by a leaden bludgeon. M.R.S. Davy recalled that Dickens's conduct towards his mother after his father died was noble. He took her in his arms, and they both wept bitterly together. Telling her that she must rely on him for the future, he relieved her mind by promptly discharging all John's debts. But all memories of the troubles and annoyances that the financial irresponsibility of the man he now called my poor father had caused him in earlier days seemed to have been much softened by now, and it was John's zealous, useful, cheerful spirit that he commemorated on his father's Highgate Cemetery tombstone. Point 13 Dickens did not allow his grief and sadness to distract him from his work for the Guild nor, of course, from work for household words. 
he decided to turn the sleeplessness from which he was suffering to account by arranging with Wills to spend the night of 3 April in Bow Street Police Station, something that would be sure to yield material for a splendid paper. Ten days later, he sent back from Malvern the proofs of a very substantial article, in the writing of which Wills had collaborated, having worked on them nine hours without stirring. Entitled The Metropolitan Protectives, it eulogizes the police, graphically describing the patience, promptitude, order, vigilance, zeal, and judgment, which watch over the peace of the huge Babylon when she sleeps and appeared as the lead article on April 26. Other commitments had also to be honored besides household words. On April 14 Dickens once more chaired the annual General Theatrical Fund dinner, and must surely have delivered with more than usual feeling a certain passage in his speech. This was the one in which he spoke of the actor having sometimes to come from scenes of affliction and misfortune. Even from death itself. To play his part before us just as all men must do that violence to their feelings, in passing on to the fulfillment of their duties in the great strife and fight of life. This most deeply held belief of his was put to a severe test when he left the hall to find Forster and Lemon waiting to tell him of the cruelly sudden death of his infant daughter Dora with whom he had been happily playing just before leaving home. Point 14 His immediate task was to tell Catherine that he did not go to Malvern to break the news to her himself, give her what comfort he could in their joint loss, and bring her back to London suggests the psychological and emotional distance that existed between husband and wife. It was Forster who went to Malvern, bearing with him a letter from Dickens to Catherine, tenderly expressed but written as though to a child who might not fully grasp the terrible thing that has happened. The second and third paragraphs read as follows. Little Dora, without being in the least pain, is suddenly stricken ill. She awoke out of a sleep and was seen in one moment to be very ill. Mind. I will not deceive you. I think her very ill. Charles Dickens there is nothing in her appearance but perfect rest. You would suppose her quietly asleep. But I am sure she is very ill, and I cannot encourage myself with much hope of her recovery. I do not. Why should I say I do, to you, my dear? I do not think her recovery at all likely. Catherine seems to have responded well to such treatment. The day after Little Dora's funeral, April 18, Dickens told Bulwer Lytton she was as well as he could hope, resigned to the baby's death and able to speak of it tranquilly. He added, She is so good and amiable that I hope it may not hurt her. She was, inevitably, very low and he tried to distract her by taking her out a good deal in connection with their impending move. He looked forward, too, to getting her away to Broadstairs. This time for five months from the end of May, in order to avoid the crowds who were now pouring into London for the great exhibition, due to open on May 1. He himself had been so shaken by the deaths of his father and his poor little pet that he had to ask for a postponement of the Royal Gala performance at Devonshire House, the event being rescheduled for May 16. By April 25 Dickens was, he reported to De La Rue, very much back in harness, amidst a mob of carpenters, gasmen, decorators, scene painters, upholsterers, theatrical supernumeraries tailors, wigmakers, and heaven knows what else. Rehearsals were resumed with great intensity. My legs swell so, with standing on the stage for hours together, that my stockings won't come off, Dickens wrote to Beard on May 13. In such interstices of time as he could find he worked with Lemon at a new farce, set in Great Malvern and called Mr. Nightingale's Diary. This was originally drafted by Lemon but Dickens, having overcome his earlier misgivings, contributed so much in the way of gags and comic dialogue, reviving the idiolex of Sam Weller and M.R.S. Gamp for the purpose, that it soon became very much a joint work. 
Dickens thought it would be a screamer and so indeed it proved to be when it was first played as an afterpiece to Not So Bad As We Seem at the second Devonshire House performance on May 27 before a very exclusive audience of fashionables. It subsequently became one of the most surefire items in the amateur's repertoire. Although there were other roles in it, including one played by the young Wilkie Collins, whom Dickens had invited to join the amateurs, everything depended on the extraordinary stage rapport between Dickens and Lemon. Their brilliantly improvised comic dialogue and stage routines varied wildly from night to night as Dickens, emulating Charles Matthews, played Gabblewig, a comic young lover who in turn plays in swift succession an astonishing variety of different characters, including a gamp-like old woman and an ancient, stone-deaf sexton. Point fifteen. Dickens wrote an account of the Guild for Household Words, May 10, but did not allow this new cause to distract him from prosecuting his old The Year of the Guild. 1850-1851 Campaigns Cain in the Fields, May 10, written jointly with R. H. Horn, dealt with rural murders and with what Dickens saw as very much a related matter, the lack of educational provision for the rural poor, and with the deleterious effects of public executions. Connected with this last concern was his sole-authored, highly topical, article, The Finishing Schoolmaster, May 17, which shows by printing application letters written by would-be deputy hangman the baleful attractiveness of this office I bestow more time than you suppose on household words, wrote Dickens on April 25 to fellow author David Moyer who had evidently been asking about his next novel, and do not contemplate any immediate resumption of my green leaves that is, publishing a new monthly part novel. He hopes, however, reversing the order of vegetable things, to come out again, about the dead of winter. It was, in the event, to be a bit longer than this before he began Bleak House but this is further evidence that the outlines of a new novel were slowly forming in his mind and mingling with his increasingly urgent concerns about the state of the nation. His disdain for parliamentary politics was not lessened by the ministerial crisis of February, when Russell and his Whig colleagues resigned after losing a vote in the Commons but the Tories' leader Lord Stanley would not come in with the result that, after more politicking, Russell's government returned to office. Nor did the electoral bribery and corruption scandal that erupted at St Albans in April do anything to increase Dickens's respect for parliamentary democracy. In due course both things were to be satirically reflected in the new novel he was now, to borrow a fine phrase from George Eliot, simmering towards. One major contemporary event about which Dickens wrote very little is the Great Exhibition. Of course he applauds it as stupendous evidence of the social, technological, and scientific progress of mankind in this summer dawn of time and he fully shares in the national pride that it was conceived and realized in Britain. However, as a spectacle and an experience it failed to stir his imagination but was, on the contrary, a very fortunatus's purse of boredom. I have a natural horror of sights, he told Lavinia Watson on July 11, and the fusion of so many sights in one has not decreased it. He then proceeds to regale her with a very funny, fantastical account about something that does stimulate his comic imagination namely visitor reactions to the exhibition in this case those of a party of very young school children. Ultimately, however, Dickens believed the whole thing was a massive distraction from what should have been major and pressing concerns for England's ruling classes. This was something he had already expressed in his last words of the old year, January 4. Which of my children shall behold the princes, prelates, nobles, merchants, of England, equally united, for another exhibition. For a great display of England's sins and negligences, to be, by steady contemplation of all eyes, and steady union of all hearts and hands, set right. 16 Charles Dickens Dickens's last public duty before the Royal Gala performance at Devonshire House was to toast the Board of Health at the first anniversary banquet of the Metropolitan Sanitary Association on May 10. 
In his speech he reverted to the infection image in a December vision noted above that was to become a leading motif in Bleak House. The wines, he warns, will carry pestilence-laden air from the seething slums to the fashionable quarters of town and if you once have a vigorous pestilence raging furiously in St. Giles's, no mortal list of lady patronesses can keep it out of Almax 17 by May 16 all was finally ready at Devonshire House and the Queen and Prince Albert and their suite arrived to attend the premiere of Bulwer Lytton's comedy. Everything went well and the Queen was sufficiently impressed to contribute £150 to the Guild's funds as well as paying £50 for her ticket. Altogether this performance and the second one on May 27 raised £2,500. The second performance saw the joyous premiere of Mr Nightingale and the evening was rounded off with an elegant supper and a ball, all munificently funded by the Duke. The following day Dickens finally managed to get away to Broadstairs where Catherine, Georgina and the family were already installed. On June 1 he wrote to the Duke from Ford House that the freshness of the sea, and the associations of the place, I finished Copperfield in this airy nest had set him to work with great vigour so that he could hardly believe he sometimes transformed himself into a theatre manager and went about with a painted face, in gaslight. The family stayed in Broadstairs for the next five months with to view this image, please refer to the print version of this book. 31 Royal Performance of Not So Bad As We Seem at Devonshire House, May 16, 1851, Illustrated London News May 24, 1851 The Year of the Guild 1850-1851 Dickens making frequent trips up to London, staying in his gypsy tent at the household words office, Devonshire Terrace being let to a tenant. In addition to routine household words and Urania Cottage business there was house hunting to be done and all the preparations for the first three public performances of Not So Bad As We Seem. These took place on June 18, July 2nd, and August 4th and realised profits of £60 per night. Besides his frequent London journeys, Dickens made many others. With Catherine to visit McCready in his Dorset retirement, with Beard to Eden to take Charlie and some of his school friends on a jolly boating excursion, to Chatsworth for a flying visit to the Duke of Devonshire in early October. Among the most well-thumbed items in Dickens's library at this time must have been the successive issues of Bradshaw's Monthly Railway Guide, a compilation of train timetables first published in 1839, that seems to have caused him not a little vexation, a letter to Austin on August 22 begins, I write this note, with a brain addled by severe study of Bradshaw but which also provided him with material for an entertainingly exasperated household words essay, a narrative of extraordinary suffering, July 12. His hunt for a new home ended on July 25 when he paid £1,542 for a 45-year lease of Tavistock House, a grand, stone porticoed, 18-roomed house in Bloomsbury, not far from his first house in Doughty Street. Frank Stone was relinquishing the lease and moving next door but one. He and his family had lived there for some years so Dickens, and presumably Catherine also, would have already been somewhat familiar with its interior. Standing in Gordon Street, across the northern end of Tavistock Square, it was the westernmost of a terrace of three houses, an original 1,796 mansion which had later been extended by the addition of two large wings, closed off from the public road by iron gates and with a handsome carriage sweep before it. It had spacious bay windows at the back on the ground and first floors, overlooking a garden that boasted a fine mulberry tree. Dickens had relied greatly on the advice of his civil engineer brother-in-law throughout all his house hunting and in early September took Austin's advice to call and cubit the builders to carry out the extensive program of alterations, refurbishment and redecoration he was planning. We do not know just how much involvement Catherine had in all this but she clearly had some as shown by an September 11th letter to her from Dickens about bedroom allocation and other matters. 
Dickens naturally concerned himself with every detail including plumbing and bathroom arrangements a cold shower of the best quality always charged to an unlimited extent, he told Austin, has become a positive necessary of life to me. And he yields to what he calls the whim of having some panels of comically titled dummy book backs, like Hansard's Guide to Refreshing Sleep, as many volumes as possible, specially made for his study. Some titles, like this one ridiculing parliamentary speech Yifeying, are satirical, others merely facetious, but several relate to what he was writing or was now looking forward to writing. One sees, for example, why Charles Dickens the author of A Child's History might amuse himself with devising titles like A History of the Middling Ages or King Henry VIII's Evidences of Christianity, and why an author moving towards the writing of Bleak House might enjoy the idea of multi-volumed short history of a chancery suit. Point 18 During this summer and early autumn Dickens either wholly wrote or collaborated on a dozen or so articles for household words. By June 9 he had completed the brilliant on duty with Inspector Field, July 14, recounting a recent nocturnal tour with Field of St Giles and other notorious London slum districts. He greatly elaborates Field's portrait as already drawn in a detective police party, highlighting the irresistible authority, geniality and apparent omniscience which will form the leading characteristics of Bleak House's Inspector Bucket. On duty with Inspector Field anticipates that novel in other ways too. It shows that Dickens has made himself a master of many of the rhetorical forms such as free indirect speech and apostrophe, whether to his readers or to one of his own characters, that he will deploy to such effect in Bleak House. In the inquest scene in Chapter 11, for example, or in the famous ending to Chapter 47, Dead, Your Majesty. Dead my lords and gentlemen. The first-person narration of Copperfield had precluded the use of these forms and, though Dickens had used them in earlier books, not always happily, we remember with a shudder his blessings on thy simple heart, Tom Pinch, in Chuzzlewit, it was not with the subtlety and complexity that he shows here. Desling stylistic virtuosity is also very much present in another article, A Flight, August 30th his fanciful paper, as he calls it, in which he relives his experience of traveling twice, once the previous year, and more recently, in February 1851, on the South Eastern Railway Company's double special express 11-hour service from London to Paris. Point 19 A flight is written throughout in the present tense, everything is flying. The hop gardens turn gracefully towards me, presenting regular avenues of hops in rapid flight, then whirl away. On July 27, a few weeks before he wrote it Dickens had counseled Charles Knight to use the present rather than the past tense in one of his shadow articles for household words, essays on famous people of the past. I understand each phase of the thing to be always a thing present, before the mind's eye. A shadow passing before it. Whatever is done must be doing. If I did the shadow of Robinson Crusoe, I should not say he was a boy at Hull, when his father lectured him against going to sea and so forth. But he is a boy at Hull. There he is, in that particular shadow, eternally a boy at Hull. It was of course the technique he himself had used in the retrospect passages in Copperfield and no less than half of his next novel was to be written in the present tense alternating with another first-person narrative. The Year of the Guild Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears